Hi, this is um, Dr. Ami Barra, your representative in Congress. Thank you for joining our live telephone town hall this evening on obviously a topic that is on um, many of our minds right now, the, the novel coronavirus or COVID-19 that we're seeing pop up in our community, but all across this country. Um, we are calling out to about 50,000 households in, in our district, but we also provided the call-in number for folks to to call in. Um, and, you know, you know, my background is as a physician, and we are going to try to give you advice and answer the questions that um, might be on your minds. We're also going to be joined by Dr. Peter Bielenson, who's Director of Sacramento County's Department of Health Services. So, again, um, right on the front lines of what's going on. Um, while those calls are going out, if you have a question that you'd like to ask, um, press zero on your phone, and we'll try to get through as many questions as we can. Um, also, if you would like to talk to a member of my staff but um, you know, don't want to ask me a question, go ahead and press seven, and you can be connected to a member of my staff. So again, press zero if you've got a question that you'd like to ask me or Dr. Bielenson. Press seven um, if you'd like to be connected to a member of our, our staff. And again, we're mostly going to focus on um, COVID-19, the, the novel coronavirus today. But if you have issues with Medicare, Social Security, veterans benefits or something else, go ahead and press seven. You know, one of our core jobs is to certainly try to help you. I know we're when we planned this, we didn't um, anticipate that the president was going to be doing an Oval Office address. So we know we're competing with the president. I'll have staff trying to pay attention to, to what's um, to, to his thoughts and, and, and comments, and you know, maybe we can address some of what he says in real time. But you know, we didn't think we ought to reschedule this because this obviously is a very a timely subject. I'm going to do something different than I've done on my other town halls. I'm actually going to just take a, a few moments to talk a little bit about you know how we got here, explain a little bit about what we know about coronavirus. Um, and then kick it over to Dr. Bielenson to talk a little bit about the local response, and then we'll open up to questions. So, again, do stay on the line. If you have a question that you want to ask, please press zero. And, again, if you um, don't want to ask the question publicly but you'd like to talk to a member of my staff, go ahead and press seven. And, again, we will try to get to as many of the topics as possible. Let me give you a little bit about my background. You know, I'm a, a, a trained um, in internal medicine you know, practice in the Sacramento community um, for, for the last 25 years prior to my um, being elected to Congress, was medical director of care management for the, the five Mercy Hospitals, now Dignity, and then was chief medical officer for Sacramento County. So, you know, have that public health background, and then was um, dean of admissions at UC Davis. So healthcare has been one of the main reasons that I ran for, for Congress. In Congress, one of my main focus areas has been global health security, and pandemic preparedness. So, you know, we've worked on these issues um, for a while. I've been on Blue Ribbon Task Forces, et, et cetera. Um, so, you know, we knew something like this was, was going to hit us, and we know this isn't the, the first pandemic we've dealt with, and it won't be the last pandemic that, that we're dealing with. Let's talk a, about this coronavirus um, specifically. In um, Late 2019, we started to, to hear, um, you know, stories of an illness in Wuhan, um, China, and, and we started to get some bits and pieces of information. Early January, we learned that this was a, a, a new, a novel coronavirus. Um, coronavirus is a virus that's been out there in, in other forms, and, and we've dealt with that before. This appeared to be a new strain, and we started to get bits and pieces. Um, you know, there are many things that, you know, I'm, I'm critical of how the Chinese responded initially, but one good thing that they did is they put the genomic sequencing out there in the public space so our doctors and scientists could start working on this. One of the first things our scientists and doctors at the CDC and NIH did was um, request to go assist um, in China. And unfortunately, the Chinese did not let our personnel in, and one of the first things you really want to do in an outbreak like this is get to the hot zone so you can try to understand exactly what's going on, um, get a sense of how this is being spread, get the best science and get the best op epidemiologists, 
and frankly, the CDC has some of the best epidemiologists in the world. Unfortunately, that was one of the, the first mistakes um, that the, the Chinese didn't let us um, get in there. And we pushed the president to put pressure on the Chinese to allow folks to get in there. And unfortunately, that didn't happen. Um, you know, about eight weeks ago, when we started getting briefed uh, about this, and we started to see that, that China was um, going into lockdown, trying to lock down a, a large city of 15 million individuals versus as well as a, a province, what we discovered was, you know, you could do a travel ban and you could try to limit um, travel from China as well as travel to China. You know, we, we already knew that wasn't going to um, stop the spread of this virus. What it would do is it would buy us some time. And that, that strategy is called containment. And that's the first thing that you do in, um, in a, um, outbreak like this is you try to contain the, the virus. Now, very early on, we understood the virus, it was going to be very difficult to contain a virus in a province in a country like China where goods and services and folks are traveling back and forth every day. I chair the subcommittee on Asia and the Pacific, and I had the very, chaired the very first hearing that Congress held on this coronavirus, and we had experts in that, and that was six to seven weeks ago. And we pointed out that, you know, while we were going to slow the virus down by having a travel ban and limiting um, travel to China and and so forth and raising it to level four status, it wasn't going to prevent the, the virus from showing up on our shores. Um, and we should take advantage of the, the time that, that, that occurred there. Unfortunately, I think we um, lost time in not preparing our um, local health um, clinics, our hospitals, um, getting supplies up and running, developing the testing supplies, et cetera. The other thing that we recommended seven weeks ago was that we should get uh, emergency funding out to the local communities, the hospitals, et cetera. Um, again, you know, that, that didn't happen. I am happy that last week Congress passed $8.3 billion of emergency funding that will go to help small businesses. It will go to um, shore up public health um, agencies, shore up hospitals, try to get equipment out, out there. But the problem is I wish we had done that six or seven weeks ago. Um, and the, the last recommendation we made was you really need someone who's in charge, a command control structure in a, a pandemic like this, um, someone who's not political because we – you know, a virus doesn't recognize whether someone's a Democrat or a Republican or of one ethnicity or another. A virus is agnostic when it comes to that. You need someone who's not going to get caught up in the politics of elections, someone who can make decisions, who can work across the various agencies, who um, can also interact with the international community. That didn't happen for a long time. You know, uh, ultimately the president assigned uh, Vice President Pence to, to be in charge while you know, nothing against Vice President Pence. I would like them to put a public health official who's nonpartisan in charge and who has the ability to give clear guidance, make tough decisions, deliver bad news to the president. You have to deliver bad news, but we've got to take this very seriously. That brings us to the second phase. Once you move past um, containment and the virus is now in your communities, two weeks ago, you know, you, you know, we had the first pos positive community-acquired case at UC Davis. This is a patient that was exposed in Solano County, got sick. It's been reported in the, the paper, so I'm not divulging any information that's not out in the public sphere. Um, and then got sicker and was transferred up to, to UC Davis on a ventilator. Um, unfortunately, not having um, the testing ability um, and the strict CDC criteria of not testing someone who hasn't traveled or hasn't um, had confirmed exposure to someone who was positive, there was a delay in getting this person tested. That wasn't on the UC Davis um, side. Um, but ultimately, that patient got tested and tested positive, and that was the first patient who had a community-acquired case of coronavirus. Again, not unexpected. We've fully expected that it's very difficult to contain a virus like this. 
Um, and, you know, what we've seen in the last two weeks is multiple cases of, of community spread. Again, that um, was to be expected. And one thing we were recommending the CDC and the, the federal government to do was to get prepared for these community cases. Uh, yeah, and, uh, I'm, I'm going to try to stay apolitical here, but I do think um, that was a missed opportunity in not getting prepared over those six to seven weeks. That moves us to, to where we are right now. Um, obviously, we've had community cases in Sacramento County and throughout California, and you're seeing them pop up, you know, all across the, the, the country. You've seen a cluster up in Seattle. And now you're hearing about this cluster in New York, in New Rochelle. Um, we can expect that we are going to see more cases of um, coronavirus. What do we know about the, the, the virus? Um, the first thing we know is the vast majority of folks that who get exposed and get infected um, are going to recover and may even be asymptomatic and not know that they were exposed. Those are the 80% of folks that are relatively healthy, don't have any chronic conditions, or younger, et cetera. Um, but we also know that there is a cohort, a population of individuals that are um, much more susceptible. These are older individuals over the age of 70 um, that have higher rates of getting sick, morbidity, um, and of the, the folks that um, may pass away, it's that cohort of individuals that are older that we have to be pretty concerned about. Um, the, the second thing we, we know is that there probably is community spread. So, you know, there is that potential of asymptomatic patients potentially to, to be spreading this this virus. Um, you know, and we don't know the extent of that community spread, but we do know there will be a lot of asymptomatic folks out there in the community. Again, most people are going to get better. Most people are not going to get ill, but there are those vulnerable populations that we have to focus in on and try to, um, you know, protect and keep healthy. There are Lots of recommendations, and, and we'll go through some of those recommendations of what we can do to try to mitigate, which is what we're trying to do right now, the spread of coronavirus. Obviously, good hygiene, and can't overemphasize the, the importance of if, you, if you're ill, if you have fevers, cough, or, or any illness, you probably shouldn't go to work. You probably should um, take a few days off, self-isolate yourself. Um, if you have the ability to get tested, get tested. Um, if um, you are asymptomatic, you're going to work, practice good hygiene techniques, wash your hands, you know, we're, we're recommending folks do the elbow bump or, you know, some, some other form of greeting as opposed to, you know, direct contact. Um, you know, again, if you're going to cough or sneeze, do so into your arm or do so into a tissue, throw that away, go wash your hands. Um, and then, you know, use daily household products, Clorox wipes, et cetera, to, you know, keep your office face clean, et cetera. So there's lots of different things that, that we can do to try to mitigate this, to try to mitigate and slow down the spread. Um, but we are taking this serious, and we have to be vigilant. And, you know, I think Sacramento County is, you know, really stepping up to the plate to try to, 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 to do this. Let's, um, you know, Dr. Bielenson, you're on. Um, if you would like to go ahead and you know, share a little bit about um, Sacramento County's um, response, and then we'll get to the questions. But again, if you have a question, press zero, and we will try to get to the questions. And thank you for your patience thus far. Uh, I did feel like we had to go through a little bit of background, though. Peter, thank you're on. Thank you very much, Congressman. Um, so what people may have been hearing is that we've gone from containment strategy, um, as Congressman Barrow was talking about, we used to do 14-day quarantine on anybody who was exposed to someone who may have had the illness, which is kind of a blunt instrument, if you will, and, um, and then contact tracing of their contacts backwards in time. But because we had so few testing um, kits available, we weren't able to identified that many people that had the disease, and so the quarantining is not as useful anymore. Um, what we're now doing is mitigation strategy, which is using a more surgical approach, if you will, where we are encouraging people to do whatever they can to keep from infecting seniors and those with chronic underlying conditions. 
So that means kids who have symptoms stay home from school, as the congressman was saying. If you're an adult, stay home from work. If, um, if you have seen relatives in a nursing home or assisted living site or just are living on their own, uh, if you feel ill, don't go visit them. And then sim similarly for senior citizens, encouraging them to avoid gathering in places with large numbers of people from malls to grocery stores. Um, and so for an, an example in grocery stores, let's say that uh, you, you don't have a family member who can go grocery shopping for you. But if you go grocery shopping and you're a senior or someone with chronic underlying condition, it makes sense to go at off hours and to get two or three weeks of a, a groceries at a time so you don't have to go back frequently. Similarly, at assisted living centers, we have strongly encouraged people, um, the, the companies that run them, to put up signs uh, laying out what symptoms people should be at, um, kept out for in terms of visitor and encouraging um, less congregate um, dining and things like of that nature. Again, the idea being to decrease the risk to seniors and people with chronic conditions to getting exposed to the virus, either from younger people who may be asymptomatic, but if they're or have mild symptoms, again, keeping them out of school, and their adult children, keeping them out of work, and try and keep seniors out of areas where they might get exposed. So that's the mitigation strategy. Great. Um, thanks for that, Peter. Let's go ahead and get to some questions again. Um, if you have a question, press zero, and we'll try to get to as many questions as we can. And if you would like to be connected directly to my staff, you can go ahead and press seven, and you'll be connected to my staff. Let me um, also just ask a quick survey question. And you know, if you answer this question, you'll join our email update list, and it, it'll be a convenient way for us to get you the latest on what's happening with coronavirus. Um, if you believe you have a, a reliable and accurate source of information regarding coronavirus, please press 1 for yes, you do have that source. Please press 2 if you don't really have good information. Um, and please press 3 if you're not sure. So, again, um, 1, if you feel like you've got a good, reliable source of information. 2, if you don't really have that reliable source. And 3, if you're if you're not sure. And, again, if by answering this question, we'll get hooked up to our email list, and it, it will give us the ability to provide you information. Thank you for that. Let's get to a first question. Um, you know, we've got a question from John. Um, John, you're on. John, are you there? Hello. Thank you. Hello? Yes, I hear you, John. Hi. Thank you, Congressman Barra. So, California already has a pretty large housing and homeless crisis, and I'm kind of feeling afraid that those vulnerable populations will be disproportionately impacted by the coronavirus. What steps are we taking uh, to protect the unhoused populations from this virus, and what resources are we getting to help keep them safe? So, so two things, and uh, I think that's a great question. One, we've been in, uh, you know, communication with some of the, the homeless providers thinking about that because the, there's there's two parts to that. Folks in a homeless shelter are particularly vulnerable because they're individuals that are living in close proximity to one another. So um, that's one that while we don't have the, the, the exact answer, because it's difficult to isolate someone who's homeless and, and – you know, to, to do surveillance on that population. So it is one we're thinking through, um, and I think they are thinking through at the local level. The second, the second um, piece of that is part of the, the homeless challenge we have in Sacramento is there are a lot of individuals that live paycheck to paycheck, um, and if they miss one paycheck, they're unable to pay their rent, um, and they get evicted. You know, we've proposed um, potentially a, a four-month um, moratorium on any evictions because we do think there will be a number of folks that are hourly workers or live paycheck to paycheck who may have to self-quarantine or they will be asked to work from home or the, their school closes and their child is now at home and they have to make a choice between going to work or, or being at home. For those folks, um, you know, we don't want to exacerbate this problem. They may not be able to make their rent and, you know, we do want to provide um, funding as temporary rental housing support so we don't exacerbate this. But 
It's a great question. It's a complicated one because the homeless population is particularly vulnerable and it is difficult to, to, to isolate them and then the shelter population is at risk. I don't have the exact answer for you other than um, it is something that's being discussed. I don't know, Dr. Bielenson, um, if, if you, you've been in contact with those providers. Yes, well. so actually we do have some plans in addition to what the congressman was saying in that we have um, gotten hand sanitizer for thousands of people. Obviously part of the reason that um, some homeless people may be more at risk is that their hygiene is not as good for obvious reasons. They can't get sinks, et cetera, and they're also at higher risk because they're chronically ill um, more times than not. So we have hand sanitizer going out, being handed out by navigators and outreach workers who are who the homeless folks are used to seeing on the streets and on the parkway. We also have uh, screen exam, many sort of screening exams of the patients when they go out to talk of the um, homeless folks when they go out to talk to them to try and identify anyone with symptoms. If anyone has symptoms, again, as I've said, um, we want to encourage them to stay home. That's obviously impossible with homeless folks. So we have a co cohort of hotel rooms that are reserved for um, across the county for um, homeless people, just as we do with tuberculosis or other types of illnesses. And then obviously, if they're sick enough, they should go to the hospital or the emergency room. Great. Let's get to uh, another question. We've got a question from Devin in Folsom. Devin, you're on. <clears throat> Several years ago, a uh, story broke that in, in, uh, people dying from poor insulin that was coming in from China. And uh, about a year and a half ago, I began getting letters about my blood pressure medicine and about recalls on the blood pressure medicine from India. And I wrote your office about my concerns about getting my medications from India. And then when I they switched my blood pressure medicine to China, I tried to find some blood pressure medicine that was made in this country or somewhere because I was concerned about that. Couldn't find anything. I also wrote your office about my concerns that we couldn't get, you know, I even checked with the major manufacturers I was going to pay extra to buy their products, like, you know, AstraZeneca and stuff like that. And it, I talked to their pharmacist, and it turned out that the major product of the blood pressure medicine came out of China. So I never heard back from your office. So I'd like to ask you, with this outbreak, we've realized now how how critical it is that we have some kind of products in this country or somewhere that we can get and not be relying on other countries, right. especially where the quality obviously is not there. So yeah, what are you going to do to, to fix this? Great. Devin, Thank that's you. A, a, a great question. I think it'll be what are we going to do, Congress and, and, and others. And I, I do think this outbreak has really exposed the dependency of the supply chain on you know, one country, in this case, China, and if that country goes down, and it's not just pharmaceuticals or medications, it's, you know, hospital supplies, et cetera. And, you know, I do think we, as the United States, are going to have to be build redundancy in the supply chain. So it can't just be dependent on one country. And I do know, you know, this is a place where President Trump has talked about trying to bring that manufacturing back into the United States trying to, you know, bring some of the, the pharmaceutical manufacturing back back into the, the United States as well. And, again, I do think it's important for us to have that redundancy in the supply chain system. And, you know, this has um, pointed out some of the, 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 the flaws of depending on one particular country um, in, in place. So that's something that I do think you, once we get through the immediate challenge, that will be discussed with the FDA and, and with others within the administration. So thank you for that question. Um, we've got a question from Sally in Sacramento. Sally, you're on. Hi, Dr. Barra. Hi, Sally. Year old, I'm a 75-year-old woman, and I've had some respiratory problems off and on. I normally go out to do shopping on Friday morning. Would it be best if I discontinued that? Or is it still, and, and it's not a case where I can go out 
at different times. I have one set time that I go because I have a caregiver that takes me. Right. Dr. Bielson, do you want to answer that? Yeah, I think, is it possible for your caregiver to do the grocery shopping themselves? She she may no longer be on the line. So, oh, so one of the possibilities, of course, is to see if your caregiver could do the shopping for you for the near foreseeable future. Um, that would make the most sense. Um, but otherwise, you, it is important to avoid as much as possible the um, external world, if you will. Um, but that being said, obviously you need groceries, and if your if your caregiver or some family member or some friend can't get it for you then you could potentially go at, at a time and and, um, and use the, the um, self-distancing techniques of not coming within six feet of people, which is the coughing range, if you will, um, not shaking people's hands, even though that may seem callous. It's, um, it's important at this time. And washing your hands carefully after touching the, um, the, the uh, grocery cart before you go home. Those are and, some common. And, and Sally, one of the things that you know we're going to try to pass an emergency bill tomorrow to also make um, pre-prepared meals available, particularly for vulnerable populations that can be delivered um, directly to, to to folks' households, similar to what Meals on Wheels does, um, but again to to a much larger extent, knowing that. We are making those recommendations for particularly vulnerable populations and, and older populations to to you know, stay home. And if you still got to eat, so if we can get those meals out to you, um, that also is one way we're going to try to address this as well. Um, we've got a question from Carol in Elk Grove. Carol, you're on. Hello, can you hear me? I can. Yeah, Carol. Okay, Congress, Cong Congressman Bear, I have just a two-part question. Um, you said that you became aware of this in, in 19. It seems like the World Health Organization and the CDC uh, weren't, I mean, I don't see a coordination on this. And so I'm wondering why we seem to be slow in the coordination. And secondly, if the demographic that is primarily impacted are seniors, why are we seeing so many school closings? Yeah, I'll I'll I'll, I'll take the 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 first part of that question, um, and then you know maybe kick the the second part over to 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 Dr. Bielenson. Um, yeah, you know, we did get first reports um, toward the end of 2019, um, and then the first real real confirmed reports in early 2020 in January. Um, I do think there was a, a slow coordinated response. Um, yeah, you know, from the World Health Organization, the CDC. I think that um, we were sounding the alarm six or seven weeks ago, um, really saying that trying to contain this in, in China and doing the travel ban wasn't going to work. It was going to buy us some time and slow down the, the spread of disease. But we knew eventually we were going to see community ca cases here in the the United States, and that it it, it wasn't you know, going to, um, you know, adequately keep the virus out of the United States. That was going to be very difficult. Um, I don't disagree with you. I think um, we squandered that five to six weeks that we could have been using to prepare to get testing capabilities up and running um, and, and build our healthcare infrastructure and supplement what our public health department and hospitals are, are doing. Um, with regards to the, the Elk Grove School District um, decision to, to close, you know, I did talk to the superintendent earlier in the week. I know he was very concerned, um, wasn't getting great guidance out of the, the CDC, and ultimately made a decision um, based on the, the, the safety of, of the kids. And, and, you know, he tried to minimize the impact by moving spring break up a, a week, but you know, Dr. Bielenson, you may have more more information that, than I do, and you know your your thoughts on the school closing. Yes. So again, as part of the mitigation strategy, the key is to try and keep the disease from spreading to those who are most risk from it, which are seniors and chronically ill. So with regard to the schools, 
Um, we've actually recommended and we just met with the Sacramento County Office of Education and all 13 superintendents today to come up with a gui with guidelines that make sense. And they are as follows, basically. That if, the, if a child is sick, keep them home, whether or not they've been diagnosed with coronavirus, because most kids are not going to end up being tested. Um, if, if there's only one or two kids in the school that are ill, there's no reason to close the school. Um, it's, obviously, you keep the kids home until they're done with symptoms for 72 hours or seven days after the first symptoms have shown up. Um, and then in terms of protecting, and, and, and the other guideline we have is that if 25% of a class or 10% of a school is absent, then we would strongly consider closing that school, just as you would in the pandemic flu, right? When there's pandemic, when there's significant flu, um, flu occurrences, it, schools don't just, schools don't close if one or two kids go out with the flu, but if the school has a, has a state of absenteeism, obviously, then we would consider closing the school. On the flip side, in terms of protecting seniors, we strongly recommended as part of this protocol that we came up with today that seniors and people with underlying conditions who are substitute teachers and or teachers or staff to tend to stay away from the school um, until the outbreak is over, understanding completely that there are labor issues and there are um, you know, uh, in terms of keeping their jobs and stuff like that. So they're working on those sorts of, um, on, for example, right, on, for example, getting state waivers for, um, for people who are out of work for a period of time. Um, those kinds of things. Yeah. And, and I know we're at the federal level, we're going to try to pass tomorrow, um, emergency funding for folks that, may not have paid um, sick leave or, or paid family leave if they have to take care of someone who's having to, to stay at home. And we do think um, that ought to be covered, and I think we're going to try to provide and pass the emergency funding to to get that covered as well. Um, we've got a question from Steve in Citrus Heights. Steve, you're on. Oh, hello, uh, Congressman. Thank you, and thank you, Doctor, for taking the question. Um, yesterday, Tom Bossert, um Trump's former Homeland Security Advisor uh, mentioned, I think it was on NBC News, um, that we are 10 days away from hospitals getting creamed. Um, also today, um, our curve of this is matching Italy's curve a week ago. I was wondering if you could kind of comment on that and if you agree on are we that close to hospitals kind of being overrun? Um, Steve, that's a great question. It's one that I think a lot of us have had had concern about. I do know we've got four great great health systems in, in Sacramento and Dignity, Sutter, UC Davis, and, and Kaiser, and the four CEOs are chatting regularly, and, and I assume with um, chatting with Dr. Bielenson as well. They are. Um, doing everything they can as quickly as possible to prepare for an onslaught of patients. I think you know, there, there are some things that we probably have to look at as emergency measures in terms of uh, the level of isolation that, that folks need to be in, um, et cetera. But those are things that I think are being worked out internally. Um, they're also looking at you know, what kind of ancillary systems can they set up so you know, not everyone who has um, symptoms, um, cough, fever, et cetera, are coming into the emergency room, but there are places where those folks can quickly go get tested. You know, one thing that we can learn from China or Korea's response to this is, you know, fever clinics, ancillary testing facilities, even drive-through testing. Um, and those are all things that I believe our four health systems are, are working on, um, you know, trying to set up to make sure – Everyone doesn't just come into the emergency room, but they rather go to the appropriate places. Dr. Bielenson, you probably can add, add some to, to how the hospitals yeah. are preparing. There are a couple of things. One of the things is telemedicine. I know that all four hospital systems are doing that. Um, so telemedicine, again, to try and keep people out of the hospital to be able to deal with them back at home. And similarly, again, our, I keep coming back to the mitigation strategy. The whole point of the mitigation strategy is decreasing the risk 
to seniors and those with underlying conditions who, if they get sick, are more likely to be needing significant care and need the hospital. So we're, by focusing on trying to prevent them from getting infected, although the curve may be going along the lines of the, the curve in, uh, in Wuhan or, or in northern Italy, um, that may not be all the serious cases. Great. Um, th thanks for that, Peter. We've got a question from John and Mather. Hello. Hi, is this John? Hello? John? Yes, I'm here. Okay, great. Um, you've got a question? Yes, thanks for setting up the uh, town hall call tonight. I appreciate that. Um, the, the question briefly is, <clears throat> was wondering um, whether you could answer if there are certain hallmarks in symptoms be to discern between uh, coronavirus and other very common reasons for a cough, whether it's something from a previous cold or, or is coronavirus always accompanied by a fever or is there anything that would give a person to think that they might have the COVID-19 uh, <clears throat> versus other reasons for coughing. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, I think I think that's one of the the, the challenges here. And uh, you know, Dr. Bielenson, if you want to take that question. Um. Yeah. So as, as far as we know, it's fever, shortness of breath, and cough, which obviously are not terribly helpful because. Everything has that. Although colds tend not to have a fever, um, it's, it is conceivable that you could have a cough and shortness of breath and may still have the coronavirus. So really the only way to tell is to be tested. Great. And that that leads us into the next question. We've got a question from Olga in Folsom. Olga, are you on? Olga? Hi, folks. Hi, folks. Hi. I'm embarrassed. Hi, I'd like to know why massive testing isn't be, isn't being done like in other countries to identify how prevalent the virus is in certain areas. It feels like the government's trying to hide the true numbers. It's difficult to know how cautious to be because our, in our community we really don't know how many cases are here. It seems like we're chastising China for trying to cover up the truth, but it kind of seems like the United States is trying to cover up as well. Yeah, Olga, that's a great question. And that's a question that um, I've raised in, in committee with the administration um, because the the best way to, to get ahead of this is to get a true sense of how prevalent this is in the, the community. I think we can look at the South Korean response to this and you know just how quickly they got testing up and running, how quickly they tested folks. And they, they were um, testing up to 15,000 um, folks a day. And I think it's been a real failure of the uh, administration response to get test kits out to the, the, the public, public health um, labs, to the hospitals, et cetera, to, to make testing readily available when a um, doctor or healthcare, pro health, healthcare professional um, thought it was appropriate. I, I do think that is one of the things that is going to make um, our response to this uh, all that much more difficult. Um, you know, I don't, Peter, if you, you'd like to add to that. Uh, I don't think so. I, the, the problem has been that CDC, in terms of giving us testing ability, has only given us enough to test to fit 20 people a day, 20 people a day, which obviously is not enough. And to your point, it's very difficult to know how, how big the, the uh, curve is of the uh, disease if you don't, if you can't test people. So we really, really need to test more people. Yeah, and and I don't I don't want to speculate in the midst of a crisis what the administration's motivation was for not making testing available or what happened at the CDC. We certainly will be digging into that to try to figure out what happened. But for right now, focusing in on in the midst of the crisis, we have to get as much testing uh, ability out the door as possible. You know, I'm glad that you know commercial um, labs have, have come into play that um, UC Davis, along with other academic health centers, are building their internal test capabilities. But all of that, sh they should have been given permission to do all of that six weeks ago or seven weeks ago to gear up to what we knew was coming. And, you know, again, it wasn't unexpected that we were going to find ourselves in this situation. So 
Um, we will be asking that question, Olga, and we will be trying to figure out what exactly happened and where the system broke down. Um, but right now, the focus really is to get the resources to um, the, the folks that are on the front lines. We've got a question from Robert in Elk Grove. Robert, you on? Hi, Congressman. Um, I own a small business. I'm in the food and beverage industry. And um, as you can expect, I've already experienced a significant loss in foot traffic and therefore income and, and revenue. Um, I'm reading other cities uh, such as Seattle, Los Angeles, and New York are proposing zero to low interest business loans, small, small business loans. Is that something that is uh, that, that you're proposing right now or thinking about to help small businesses in Sacramento County? That, and, that is. Um, so no, go ahead. One, of, one, one of the things we passed last week in the, the $8.3 billion emergency funding bill was $1 billion in funding, um, which would allow the, the Small Business Administration to provide about $7 billion of loans to small businesses because we understand Sam, the small businesses are the ones that that are going to be hit the hardest. Um, we also are pushing, um, you know, financial um, institutions to to provide those low interest or, or, or zero interest uh, loans to again let let um, businesses like yours get through this because it is you know it, it's going to impact large businesses like the airlines and others. But the folks that are going to really feel the brunt of it if you know, your restaurants or others, you know, people are not going out to eat are the small businesses that operate on smaller margins. Um, so we're going to do everything we can to try to get that emergency funding out to you to get low interest loans out to you. Again, we did um, last week pass and the president signed into law that the $1 billion of funding that the SBA would have. If you could reach out to the, the local SBA and, and if you want, um, call my office at 916-635-0505 if you don't have their contact, and they can go ahead and um, connect you to the, the, the SBA. But those money should be getting out um, and should be available to our local SBA. So great question. And, again, hang in there, and we'll do what we can to get you through this. Um, we've got a question from Gary and Folsom. <laughs> Yes, hi. Um, I'm concerned about this about Sacramento County calling off automatic 14-day quarantines. Dr. Berlinson has been quoted, once you get a certain number of cases, it's hard to continue to contact trace back the way that you tried originally. Sacramento County has declared an emergency, and are there funds now available that you can have that you have asked for to increase staff for traceback, even possibly college volunteers. Um, also comment that public outreach, uh, there doesn't seem to be enough people that are concerned about this and are taking any of the uh, uh, precautions. So what is being done with regard to public outreach in Sacramento County? Great. Gary, um Thank you for that. I'll take the second part of that question, then um, I'll let Dr. Bielson answer the, the first part of the, the county's strategy. Um, again, in the bill that we're hoping to pass tomorrow, we've also made a recommendation that we need to put more, more funds into it to do public education, like public service announcements, et cetera, to make sure the public knows what mitigation steps they, they can take what good hygiene steps, et cetera. So that information is getting out there both on traditional broadcast that, you know, in um, digital, social media, et, et cetera, on the platforms where people gather their information, and also in multiple languages. I hope it's in the, the bill tomorrow. We've made that recommendation that we think from a public health perspective, you know, getting accurate, reliable information out there is incredibly important because a lot of people aren't going to go to the CDC website, but if we can put it on a place where they access information normally like social media, et cetera, you know, that would be helpful. Dr. Bielenson, would you like to you know, touch on you know, kind of the county approach, you know, going from containment to mitigation? Yeah, I'm not sure that that quote was actually completely accurate, but your point is very well taken about using um, volunteers and others. 
We have, in fact, used a large number of volunteers to help us with the contact tracing. Our declaring a state of emergency is really to allow us to bring down funds to get reimbursed from the federal government and the state government after the fact, but it doesn't keep us from using volunteers. What I really was saying was that, again, as I sort of talk, was talking about earlier on on our phone call, is that because there are so few tests being done, we kind of have covered, we've quarantined everybody that has been, pretty much everyone that's been exposed to a case, but we only, because we've only been testing 20 people, 20 folks a day, we've, we've only tested about 100 people in the last two weeks when we, since we've had the, the kits. And so there's just not, we, we've kind of run the, the uh, course on, on covering people. And so what we've gone to now is mitigating because we've had to go to mitigating the, the uh, mitigation strategies to try and decrease the risk to those who are most at risk. Thanks. Thanks for that. Let's go to the next question. Um, we've got a question from Mary in Sacramento. Hi. Uh, thank you both for your work and for posting this call. Um, I hear a lot, and rightfully so, about the spread and containment and mitigation, but I haven't heard anything yet about the end game. And you know, is, is there an immunity that happens with this virus? Like, oh, I had chicken pox as a kid, so I'm not going to be able to get chicken pox now as an adult. Does this virus act like that? And the second part of my question is, when we were raising our kids 20 years ago, we were worried about superbugs and the overuse of antibiotics and um, um, antiseptic sprays and things like that that would, you know, lend themselves to helping with superbugs. So we pulled back on using those things. And I know, of course, antibiotics aren't effective for viruses, but are there, is there a concern about using all of these sanitizers and wipes and antibacterial type products um, at a greater rate now? Yeah, let, uh, yeah I, I can go ahead and take the, the first part of that question. Yeah, I, I happen in regular communication with some of the scientists and, and so forth, the folks that are studying this. Um, you will develop an immune response to um, the virus. And again, the vast majority of folks um, are going to have mild symptoms or, or maybe even no symptoms, not even know they were ever exposed or infected. Um, we don't know enough about, you know, how long that immune response Last, will it give you lifelong immunity? Will, you know, give you immunity for a short period of time? Um, and, and go into the, you know, you, you may be exposed again in, in the next season. Um, we don't know specifically the answer. If, you know, you've been infected once, you develop an immune response, could you get the virus a, a, again? A lot of those the scientists are working pretty, pretty hard on some of those answers. My best sense, and again, this is an opinion, this is not fact, is that you know, once you get that exposure, you are going to develop a certain level of immunity that should provide some level of protection, hopefully get us through this um, season of coronavirus. This virus may be with us now that it is pretty prevalent. And, you know, I, I think here's another fact that hasn't come up, and you'll hear different information. The earliest we will have a vaccine that's available for public use is 12 months, and that probably is optimistic. It's probably closer to 16 or 18 months, and you know, that is incredibly quick to get a virus or to get a vaccine that's available to the public. That said, you know, for the, the vast majority of folks that get exposed, get infected, and recover, that may actually give us the, the time where we get to the gold standard treatment, which is getting a vaccine. And I'm fairly confident that we will have a vaccine. It'll just take, um, you know, that 12 to, to 16, 18 months to, to have that vaccine available for the public. Um, Peter, do you want to add anything? To just in terms of and stuff like that, um, if anything that would cause, you know, mutation of viruses, in this case, this came from bats to civets, which are little cats, I think, to humans. And so it's, there's no good evidence at all, I think, that that, that has re resulted in, uh, in this illness. Great. Thanks. We've got um, a question from Sharon and Folsom. 
Sharon, you're on. Hi. Yeah, um, thank you so much for taking the time uh, to have this call today. So um, I'm not entirely sure my question makes a whole lot of sense now that the NBA has just suspended their season, but I was going to ask about um, the county mitigation strategies like closing large sporting events and why that hasn't happened. Um, it seems like the current way that I'm interpreting the uh, mitigation strategies is putting a lot of burden on older adults and immunocompromised people. Um, also, as it relates to school, I've read some peer-reviewed studies about how the approach could, in fact, help to flatten that curve and reduce the burden on healthcare professionals, um, especially since children can be carriers of the virus and not be presenting any symptoms. So just looking for some comment on those. Sure. Areas. Sure, sure, and I'll 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 touch on that and and see if Dr. Bielinson wants to add anything. I I I do think there's um, discussion back and forth about um, the efficacy of um, you know large gatherings, et cetera. Now that you're seeing that that happen, though, it probably will slow down and, and mitigate some of the the spread of the the of um, the virus, and you know may create some social distancing. Um, and you know we you know watching the NBA cancel their season, look seeing the the um, NC2A tournament you know being um, played out outside of crowds, it probably does make sense. And I, I think you'll see Governor Newsom making um, some statements at the at the state level um, that you know we ought to minimize those large gatherings. You know we're we're, we're obviously seeing it in cancellations of um, you know conventions and, and things like that. You know, I, I do think those, you know, those social distancing practices will help us get ahead of, um, you know, the, this virus and will give us a, a better chance to slow down the spread of that virus. And, you know, they're not necessarily um, bad things to do. They're, they're things that could help us get ahead of this. So I don't, I don't know if Dr. Bjornsson, if you want to add anything. No, I'm okay. Okay. Um, We've got a question from John in Gold River. Hi, uh, Congressman and uh, Doctor. Um, I, both my folks are in the uh, Carlson facility in Elk Grove. They're quarantined right now, and fortunately are, are not showing any symptoms. But I'm just trying to understand, uh, you talked about there's 20 tests available a day. Is that countywide and you know, half of the deaths that have occurred in nationwide are in one facility in Washington, and I just don't, you know, I, I'm, I'm just trying to understand how that's being prioritized and what's being done to assure that we get more tests and how fast and what, what update you can give me. So at, at the federal level, we're doing everything we can to push the CDC and the FDA to um, – Really ramp up the, the the testing process or provide those emergency licenses for other private sector companies, commercial companies to get their tests readily available because that's the tool Dr. Bielinson really needs um, in his valley work. And and you know Peter, I don't know if you want to comment on how the county is approaching senior facilities and, and others. Yes, yeah, so we um, we have 20 tests a day. We triage them first on the triage list are are the seniors. With serious conditions or exposure to the uh, to the virus, which obviously includes this issue, um, we do have st we do have statewide. Um, so that's in the Sacramento lab. We have the 20 cases, 20 um, tests. Then there's about 1,500 tests that are able to be run per day in the entire state of California to the public health lab, and that just started to come online. And then lab core, so that will help, I presume. And then LabCorp and Quest, which are two lab laboratory companies, are coming online in the next day or so um, with a, a, eventually a significant number of tests that they'll be able to do. However, um, not that this makes you feel any better, but the um, LabCorp actually, although they can get the swabs done here in, in Sacramento, they send the, the, the uh, samples to North Carolina to get read, which obviously will have to be changed. Um, but in terms of your um, your loved one, um, there we do testing of our own, which we are going out from in a, in a circular fashion from the contacts that the that the um, the person who died had, 
and then going to the California State Labs to be able to get the additional amount of work. So I think there are 143 um, people in that nursing home, if I'm not mistaken. Great. Thank, thanks for that. I, I know we're coming up on uh, about one hour on this this call, and I know um, we're going to get through a, a, another question or two, and then we will have to, to wrap this up. If we didn't get your question, if you would press 7, and you'll be connected to my staff, I do want to try to answer everyone's question. Obviously, we can't get through all of them this evening. But if you talk to my staff, they'll get your information, take down your questions, and so forth, and we will try to get a, get an answer for you, um, either electronically or um, in some other other mechanism, or link you to other services. Again, um, as this is rapidly evolving, we will try to continue to push information out because that that is one one of the most important things that we can do is make sure that you, as our constituents and the people in our community get accurate information in a timely way um, because the, the other risk here is disinformation and getting the wrong information out there. So let's, um, you know, um, take one or two more questions and, you know, let's take a question. There's a question from Kyle and Fair Oaks. Kyle, you're on. Yes. Um, as a proud Omni Bear supporter and also being a Republican, I voted for you. I love you. And I want to let you know that have you reached out to the administration? Because I feel that your expertise in the field is the reason why many of us in the area have voted for you year after year. You know, Kyle, thank you for that question. Yes, we're working um, very closely with the, the CDC, with Health and Human Services, with NIH. And you know, these are folks that I've worked pretty closely with. You know, um, Dr. Tony Fauci, someone I know very well, um, you know, Dr. Director Redfield at the, the CDC or Bob Cadlick at HHS. They're folks that we've worked on pandemic preparedness. Um, I, I really do think they're eminently qualified and, and folks that know what they're doing. I also just worry that um, at the highest levels in the administration, the whole decision-making process, um, the one thing that we've consistently shared with Vice President Pence and others is yeah, you know, let the the doctors and the scientists do their jobs and make their recommendations, even if they're they're tough recommendations that um, you know may make the president upset or not be what the president wants to hear. This isn't a time for politics to to get in the way. This is a time for us to allow science and medicine to to really direct what we have to do and what our response is. And I think the president's starting to 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 get that. I didn't get it. I'll go back and watch his his um, Oval Office address today, but I'm starting to get the impression that he now realizes the severity of what we're dealing with. I wish he had come to that realization six or seven weeks ago, but we are where we are. Now's not the time to go back and relitigate the last six or seven weeks, but rather focus all our efforts on getting ahead of this and, and getting the resources out to the folks on the front line, the doctors, the nurses, the, the, the public health, professionals, because um, that's where this is going to be fought and won. So, and, and I think that's the best thing we can do. The administration and Congress get on the same page and push the resources and support out to the healthcare professionals. And then also for the American citizens that are going to get impacted by this, where you know that person who's an hourly worker who now is being asked to, to stay home for two weeks, they can't afford that loss of, of paycheck, and we've got to make sure that we give them that safety net. Or the person who's uninsured, who's having symptoms, we've got to make sure they're not afraid to go get tested and they're not worried about you know, what that copayment is, et cetera. Those are things that we in the administration, I think will be on the same page and we'll push those resources as quickly out to the front lines. The small business owners um, who you know are gonna lose their business if they can't get those zero interest loans to carry them through some of this. So. Um, that is a place where I'll work pretty closely with the administration. I, I want to thank everyone who is on, on our call this evening. Um, if we haven't gotten on your, um, gotten to your question, please stay on the line after the event and you'll be directed to a voicemail box um, where you can leave your question. Make sure you leave your name, your contact information, if that's an email address or a phone number. You can also press 7, and you could be connected with a live person 
um, and they can try to get that information as well. And again, um, it does, you know, we had um, a lot of participation on, on this call. We will continue as this is um, a real fluid situation, try to give you regular updates, try to, um, you know, both electronically, if you if you haven't signed up for our email list, please, please do so. Um, and you can do that by you know, pushing seven and talking to one of my staff members. Um, and I really do want to thank Dr. Bielinson. You know, he's on the, the, the front line here. Um, the advantages that we have in Sacramento County is we really do have four health, health systems and a county public health office that are all working closely together, coordinating, um, and, you know, trying to, to get the best information out there. Um, and again, we will get through this. Um, we will all have to work together and information will change from time to time. But, you know, I, I really do, um, we're going to all work together to, to get through this. Dr. Bielinson, do you have any last, um, last, um, comments or, or thoughts? No, just thank you very much and thank you for your questions. Great. Okay. Well, and, you know, my staff just handed me something. Um, they said not to press seven, um, but do stay on the line and you'll be directed to a 